Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that uh, I, I always found interesting about our military is that we reward, we reward individuals that do things that we call valiant, gallantry. Uh, uh, uh. They do certain things that are beyond measure, and that measure usually tends to be their life, right? Uh, 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 do we know? Uh, 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 who, who does not know what that uh, award is called? Medal of Honor. That's exactly what it is. It is the highest decoration, the highest award given to an individual. And, and, and it usually, usually comes attached with your life being lost. You know, you, you done, you've done something that's harder, beyond uh, 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 what anybody would have expected. Uh, 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 you know, John, uh, Manila John, John Bassalon, uh, 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 during World War II, after uh, coming home, a hero, given the Medal of Honor, ended up going back uh, 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 into war uh, and ended up getting killed in the field. A lot of people thought that that was uh, 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 insane. A lot of people thought that it was reckless. A lot of people thought... Uh, that it was valiant. A lot of people thought that it was gallantry. Uh, at the end of the day, we remember him as a hero. Uh, we remember him as a man that uh, uh, allowed himself to put in harm's way uh, uh, for the nation he loved. It could have been that that's what he knew. But at the end of the day, what he did is remember till today's day. But one of the thing was, it was that his call cost him everything. The call that he answered cost him his life. And a lot of times as Christians, uh, uh, we find ourselves in situations uh, uh, that we feel uh, 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 are so much more than we can handle. And, and I'm going to tell you this much, it's okay to feel that way. I know, it's strange to tell you that when you feel despaired, when you feel that somehow you're going through something that you can't handle, it's okay to feel that way. It's wrong to stay stuck there. Let's read the Word of God. And we're going to pick it up uh, uh, right in uh, uh, verse 3. And the Word of God uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 starts and reads as follows. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of, of all comfort, who com uh, comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth uh, by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be partakers, excuse me, so shall ye also of the consolation. For we would not... Brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, and so much that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that He will yet deliver us. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your blessings. Thank You for Your Word. Father, thank You for Your great salvation. Lord, thank You for Your faithfulness towards us, Father. And Lord, I just pray You right now, Lord, that You remove me aside. That Your Holy Spirit, Father, prepares the hearts and the minds of Your people, Lord, your people, 
Father, that we may digest what your word has to tell us today, Father. And not only that we listen, Father, but that we listen and allow it to influence and change us. Father, that we be not stiff-necked people. And that we allow your perfect will to come to fruition in our lives. I pray and beg and ask you all things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen. So uh, one of the things that, that we need to understand is, 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 if you don't know this by now, Paul was kind of a nomad, right? He went all over the place, and, and his job was very simple. He was an apostle, and he, w- he would preach the gospel throughout all, uh, 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 all the world. Uh, uh, we need to understand that Paul, there were certain places that he wanted to go to, and God told him, no, you're not going there. We need to understand that there were situations where Paul went to places and, and, and was stoned to death, uh, was tried, was buffeted, was imprisoned. All of the sufferings that he endured was for the cause of Christ. For, uh, so he actually put himself in situations so that the gospel of God would be preached in everywhere he went. Uh, 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 I love the fact that right off the bat, as he's getting ready to tell people about some problems that that, that he's going through, some issues that have have had him to the point where he wished he were dead. So good to see you, my dear sister. How are you feeling? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. I'm a different. I apologize if you're a visitor. I don't know if we had any visitors, but I like to see our people back. So good good to have you here healthy. Um, but uh, uh, he's, he starts by saying, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of comfort, of all comfort. So he starts by telling you, hey, God is good. God's mercies are abounding. God's comfort, it's a comfort for everything that you can go through. It's the, uh, he is the God of all comfort. Doesn't matter what problem, what situation you find yourself in today, He can comfort you through it. But here's one thing that we need to understand. What has to take place in order for you to be comforted? Trial. Trouble. A bad situation. You cannot be comforted if you're not going through a struggle, through a trial. So when God is telling you that He is the God of all comfort, He's letting you know you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through tribulations. But Paul makes it a point to let you know before he tells you about the problems he deals with, that God is good. That God is a God of mercy. That God is a God of comfort. So he's, he's setting up the stage so that when he tells you of his problem, you already know. Hold on. He's, he's going to tell us about all his problems, but he's already said that God is good. And that's, a, that's something that we need to replicate when we talk to people. Instead of complaining about everything in life, saying, you know what? God is so good that in spite of me going through this, I know he's with me and he will comfort me through it. But the problem is, family, is, is that we're such a, 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 a feeble-minded people that we forget God's goodness. And all we focus is on the problems that we may face. And I'm going to tell you this much, family. We don't have it as bad as others do. You know, the bottom line is, is that there's people on this earth that have it worse than us. And there's people on this earth today that are battling literally with their lives to spread the gospel of God. That there's people that are meeting today somewhere in this world in secret out of fear of government or uh, of religious uh, persecution. To the point that their lives is in danger. But what do we do here in this great nation of ours? We complain. We complain. Instead of recognizing right off the bat how good God is. The fact that we are in this nation today. This is not a right. This is a blessing of God. Is this country perfect? Yet you got people risking life and limb to get here. 
I'm going to tell you this much, family. Stop complaining. Listen, I'm not a Cuomo fan. But I pray for that man. I pray for that man. Because he needs to get saved because God died for him. Not only that, he is our governor. Understand, I don't care if you like President Trump or not. You need to pray for him. That God gives him wisdom and leads him because he is our president. We need to start being grateful because the bottom line is, is we get what we deserve a lot of times so that God allows his people to see where their sin is leading them. More importantly, sometimes to remember how good we have it or had it or could have it if we simply turn back towards God. Paul goes on to talk about it. It's a, it's a, it's a strange statement to me in verse 4 when he says, Who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. I tell you, I, I, I heard that statement. I was a little confused because it made it sound to me like sometimes God allows us to go through things so that we can comfort someone else. Isn't that a strange statement? A lot of times we need to understand that when God allows you to go, to go through something and He comforts you through it and He sees you through it, there's an expectation that we do the same for others that are going through a simil- the same or a similar trial. You know, one of the things that I, 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 it, it, it's a fearful thing to me is, is loss. I hate loss. I hate death. You know, and, and a lot of us have uh, had, had to deal, deal with it. And, and we need to understand that if the rapture tarries, we will suffer more loss. Are we going to still be here to comfort each other? Are we going to be in the right place spiritually that we can comfort each other? I got to tell you, and, I, and, and, and uh, I thought I saw it. So. I was so happy to be able to be here with Sonia and her family to be part of God's comfort in their life. What a blessing it was for me to be able to be a part of God's perfect plan in comforting one of her children, one of his children. But if I wasn't serving God, if I wasn't here, I would have never gotten the privilege of being part of God's comfort in her life. In the life of her children, in the life of her family. When you go through something, you need to be thankful to God that He's there with you. And not only that, it's like that old saying says, turn something negative into a positive But the problem is, is that we stay stuck in the negative and forget the goodness, the comfort, the mercies of God. You know, I've talked to people in the midst of their loss, and one of the things I always tell people is remember the good times. Remember, if the person saved, that you will see that person again because God has promised it. Not because you're good, not because they were good, but because God has promised it and has said that you will see them again. And, and, and instead of focusing on the loss, instead of focusing on the negative aspect, and fo- focus on the good memories, focus on God's goodness that He gave you an amount of time with that individual, that that individual was saved, that that individual made you smile, that that individual made you happy, and remember the goodness of God in the midst of it all. Because you will be able through your tribulation and the comfort of God, to comfort others to go through a similar or the same situation. Because you understand that uh, uh, those are our sufferings, but the Bible talks about that we are to take part in the sufferings of Christ. That's a strange statement. The sufferings of Christ. If you are... A Christian, that is part of your life. And, and, and it talks about the suffering, loving. Why did, what was one of God's suffering? 
For God so loved the world, right? That He gave His only begotten Son. You should be willing to love what God loves. And it's hard. It ain't easy loving people. I'm going to be honest with you. It is a very hard thing to do. Because love isn't, uh, 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 it doesn't have, it doesn't choose sides. Love isn't hypocritical. Love isn't based on circumstances. Love isn't based on situation. Love, the Bible says, covereth a multitude of sin. Love forgives. Love sacrifices. Love will cause a man to lay down his life for his friend. And that's part of the sufferings that we partake on daily if we call ourselves Christians. Is in loving the brethren, loving the, uh, 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 God's people the way God loves His people. But I will be honest with you, it ain't easy. It comes with uh, a, a suffering. It comes with heartache. It comes with stress. It comes at times with despair. In verse 8 is the, the, the meat of this message. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. That we found ourselves in a situation that we couldn't handle. That we found ourselves in a situation where I was despaired. Where I felt that there, that there was no solution. Where I felt that there was no way out. He, even Paul, even goes as far as to say that uh, 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 in so much that we despaired even of life. It was so bad I didn't even want to leave, live. Now, what type of situation where Paul, one of the greatest men to walk this earth, says that I, I wanted to die. The situation was so bad that I wanted to quit. I wanted to be done with it. I wanted to die. But pastor, the Bible says that God won't allow me to go through something that, that I can't handle. Eh. Sorry, that was wrong. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says uh, 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 in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that he's not going to allow you to go through a temptation. A temptation to which you cannot endure. But God will put you at times through trials that press you out of your uh, uh, capabilities. Too hard for you to handle. You, you're, you're not, listen, uh, that, that, that verse right there is telling us that there, is, there, there could be, I pray that never we deal with it, that we never go through it. But God is saying that there could be a situation that you're going to go through where you're going to feel like you want to die. That you can't handle it. That it's too much for you. And I'm going to tell you this much, you are 100% right. You can't handle it. You're 100% right. You can't deal with it. But we had a sen the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. First thing you need to realize when you find yourself in those situations, do not trust your instincts. Do not trust yourself. The Bible refers to uh, 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 the man that trusts in himself as, as cursed. Back in Jeremiah, he says that you are the cursed is the man that puts his trust upon another man. You're cursed. You're a fool. You need to put your trust in God. That is where all Christians should be relying upon, especially when you go through a situation in your life that you can't handle. Because verse 10 says that who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Listen, you are right. You can't handle it. You are right. 
you will not be able to handle it. You're going to feel despaired. It's okay to feel despaired. It is not okay to stay there. Because we serve a living God and He is able to deliver us. You see, in the midst of this problem that Paul is going through, he understands that I cannot overcome this tribulation. I cannot overcome this problem. I cannot deliver myself out of this. I need God to deliver me. And He will deliver you. But you need to run to Him. You know, I remember, uh, as a child, uh, 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 we lived in a, in a really rough place. Uh, uh, a lot of shootings, we had shootings every other day at the time. Uh, 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 a lot of, I still remember a friend of mine, we were coming home from school, there's a shooting, uh, there was this, this wall, this concrete wall, we hide behind it, we go around the corner, and it was his father laying there. You think that kid did not feel despaired? You think that kid was dealing with something that's beyond his measure? Things like that happen often, and there was one place where I could always run to. Where was that place? Home. Home is where I knew safety laid. Home is where I knew the two people that would die for me were. Why is it that we don't run home to our Father when struggle and trials come our way? You know, I never blamed my parents for the circumstances that happened in Ejincon Taino, the, the, the caserio, the residential complex I grew up in. I never blamed them for the circumstances that took place in, in that place. Why is it that we blame God for the circumstances that take place in our lives? Instead of running to Him and saying, Lord, this is what I'm going through, I need you. I need you to deliver me. No, what we tend to do, sadly, is we blame God for the situations that take place upon our lives based uh, upon the result of what we've done. We forget so quickly that we tend to get somewhere by us getting to that place. You know, I've never driven a car, closed my eyes, went to sleep, and somehow I woke up somewhere. It doesn't work that way, right? You have to consciously put yourself in that vehicle and drive somewhere to get to that place. Well, guess what? That's how life happens. We do certain things that lead us to where we're at today. Pastor, if you knew my life, you'd understand. No, I wouldn't. I don't know your life, but I do know that you're not perfect, neither am I. I do know that, uh, uh, that what we deserve is hell. But by God's grace and His love towards us, He sent His Son to suffer what He didn't deserve, to go to where He didn't deserve for you and I. You know, that there is no human being on this earth, ever, present, past, and future, that has gotten what they've deserved? Present, past, or future in comparison to Christ. You see, Jesus Christ got what He didn't deserve. The King of kings, Lord of lords, got what you and I deserve. That's what he did. He took our place at that cross. He took our place when he descended unto hell for three days and three nights. That was our place. Yet he took it. What he didn't deserve. Amen. And you talk about pressed. Blood. His sweat. Blood. Out of stress. Our pastor, he was happy to die for us. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He begged the Father to let this, pa this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, thy will be done. You see, 
He submitted himself to the will of the Father. Press beyond. I, I hate the movies because, you know, when, when he's in, in the cross, the hell, uh, when he says, Father, why hast thou fors- forsaken me? Uh, that had to be an, he had to scream those words. The earth turned black. The earth turned black. The Son of God. The perfect Son of God died in our place. Do you comprehend the magnitude of that? Do you comprehend the magnitude of the stress, of the suffering that Christ endured for you and I? And he says that, and he had to submit himself unto that death. He had to submit himself unto the ridicule unto the punishment, unto the abuse, unto the unfair trial, unto everything. And everything was okay until it became, uh, uh, it came to the point of the separation between him and his father. You ever seen a relationship between a father and a son that is so close that you're like, wow, man, I, I want my son and I to have that relationship. My child and I to have that relationship. Or a mother and a daughter, they're just so close. They're like uh, 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 skin and nail. God was closer than that to his son. They were one. They are one again. And because of you, that relationship was separated. Because of you and I. You talk about being pressed beyond measure. And he had only one thing to rely on. Obedience to his father. Submitting himself to the death of the cross out of obedience to his father. Family. There's going to come situations where we're going to feel that we can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure you're right. How do you handle the death of a loved one? How do you handle the worst thing that can happen, the death of a child to a parent? How do you handle the loss of a spouse? It's beyond comprehension. Yet somehow... God gets us through it. Yet somehow, God's goodness is seen, not only in the comfort that He gives us, but in the comfort that we receive also from His people. And what a blessing it is to be part of God's comfort towards others. But the problem is that a lot of times, family, We live in a world of selfishness. Pastor, uh, I'm not selfish. If that doesn't apply to you, God bless you. You're better than I am. But we need to stop being selfish and start appreciating what the Lord has given us. You know, I don't know if I shared this story with you guys. I'll close with this shortly, I promise, that I probably won't. <laughs> and I hope, don't, don't, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in doing this, but when I was a kid, a long, long time ago, long, long ago, uh, my, my, we lived in this, the apartment complex I grew up in, my, my aunts, one of my aunts, uh, uh, liked to go out a lot. She had two little girls, right? Uh, Aisha was one of them. Aisha was like a sister to us. She was always in our house. Used to bother me, oh my goodness, to no avail. Uh, she would run into my bedroom, right? 
she run into my bedroom and like every morning and just start jumping in my bed, uh, start pulling on my leg, you know. She was like three years old and, you know, uh, I remember she had this humongous eyes. Uh, and one night we kept, we were going to keep her overnight. My aunt came home. Uh, excuse me, we we're going to keep her overnight. And I was like, oh, my goodness, here we go again. Oh, I'm not going to get sleep. Oh, this kid's going to drive me insane. Uh, uh, she would literally just sometimes, like, go in my bed, and I would go into bed, and uh, 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 she'd be there. And I'm like, oh, Aisha, go to the girl's room. You know, this, this is my room. And Aisha would just cry and go away and go complain to my mother. My mother would yell at me. All right? Aisha was three years old. She was the new baby of the family, you know. Um, so when she was four years old, you know, fast forward four years old, excuse me, five years old, uh, uh, that night came on and she was going to stay over her house. And, oh, my goodness, sure enough, she drove me insane. Like, a lot. Like, just, she wouldn't stop. And my aunt came home uh, uh, about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning to my house to pick up the girls. You know, my mom's like, no, no, no. Uh, my dad's like, Malita, that's your mother, enough. So my mother, what did she do? So she took him home. Uh, the next morning, you know, my, my aunt was tired from partying, and she went to sleep. She stayed asleep late. Aisha got out of the house. Uh, she went downstairs to play, found herself in a dumpster, and, and found this bottle of candy. And she took the candy. Well, there were volumes. She took about 37 volumes. Uh, Aisha suffered and died about a week later. Uh, This was... I think it was 1985, 1985, sorry, till I don't remember what she looked like. Yet, I like to laugh when I think about her. See, even though she had a short life, She influenced my life. She made me laugh. She made me mad at times. I remember being so mad at God. I mean, think about it. Five years old. Got criminals that live to be a hundred. I thought I was pressed beyond measure. I was a kid. I think I was, I was five. I think I was, no, I had to be 83 because I was eight years old. I was five. I was, 10, I was 10 years old. Uh, you talk about being pressed beyond measure. Ten-year-old kid dealing with death of pretty much a little sister. And I've been able to talk to people with loss. Because unfortunately, I've dealt with loss. God somehow comforted us through the whole thing. My mother was angry at my aunt for years. And she had to forgive her. And it gave her peace when she forgave her. And I tell you that story to tell you this simply. That even though you find yourself in a place that... So bad that, like I said, it was 80, 
485. Uh, looking at what? 35 years almost ago. So bad that I still remember, and as you can see, it still moves me. God will get you through it. Be involved and close to God so that you can comfort others in the midst of a trial that seems so much that you can't deal with it. You see, there's things that we can't deal with and can't handle. And that's normal. That's normal. But as Christians, we're not normal people. We're abnormal by His grace. Because we can rely upon His strength, not my strength. Because I can trust Him, not myself. Because He is my all and all. He is my salvation. He is my strength. He is my refuge. He is life. And in Him I trust. In Him I am persuaded. As Christians, our, uh, 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 His will is perfected in our weakness. In our despair, His mighty hand shows. In our worst moments, it's when He's ready to just extend a hand with this one I will close I think one of my favorite one of my favorite not analogy excuse me uh, history in the Bible is Peter walking on water and it wasn't so much Peter walking on water it's when Peter sank I know that's something weird to say, right? Why is pastor's favorite portion, Peter sinking? You see, Peter walked on water because he answered God's call, right? Say, call, come. So he took a step. And everybody, you know, in a boat. By the way, how many other people were there? At least. Eleven other people at least, right? It's kind of funny, we criticize Peter, but yeah, he's the only one that actually stepped out of the boat. So he's, he's watching the waters. I don't know if you've ever been in the ocean. You know, it's, uh, it's got these things called waves. <laughs> right? And, and, and I can imagine that first step. And you talk about taking a step of faith. I, I, I envision him closing his eyes. I could be wrong. But I envision him closing his eyes and going like, oh, and, and, and I'll just, little by little, oh, just looking at Christ, right? Just looking at Christ, just looking at Christ, and all of a sudden something happens and he goes like, And it starts to sink, right? And have you ever jumped in water? You know, I hate the movies, you know, when they start sinking them slowly. Oh, no. When you sink in water, it's right through. And he cries out and throws his hand up. You know, I don't believe that he pointed, he just threw his hand up and cried. And immediately... God grabbed them, pulled them up. You see, Peter was dealing with a situation he couldn't handle. He was sinking quickly. And he throws his hand to heaven and calls upon God. And God grabs him. Not only that, doesn't take time. He grabs him and pulls him up. And here's my favorite part of the story. Logan, I like this part. You got to listen to this one. I mean, so Landon, Landon, Logan, 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 somewhere over there. What's Logan? Somewhere over there. Different family. Sorry, uh, Landon. Right. So he grabs Jesus by the hand. Right. And Jesus got him. And he, he doesn't let go. And Peter walks hand in hand with God. 
Peter's just walking with God on water. That should be our life. Walking hand in hand with God. Because even in water, we can walk on it as long as we're hand in hand with Him. I can imagine Peter, uh, uh, God, can we take the long way around? I would have. And they walk on water hand in hand, and they get back on. And the interesting part is, right? They, they walk to the boat, by the way. You know. The interesting part is you don't hear what happened afterwards, right? Like, I'm pretty sure Peter, everybody's looking and everything, and Peter goes like, <laughs> I walked on water with Jesus, yo. I'm out of sick, but I walked on water with Jesus. There's only one man that can lay claim to that. You know what? It's funny because a lot of preachers make fun of Peter. He was a hothead. He was always getting himself in trouble. Yeah, he got himself into a lot of trouble. Got in several, he even got in trouble with God himself. <laughs> Nobody could ever question his love for God. The only one that questioned it was God himself. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Feed my, life, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? God, you know all things. You know I love you. Can we say that? Can we say, you know I love you? Because he loves you. Unmeasurably. In a way that we will never understand until we're face to face with him. Sonny, I apologize. Can I make an analogy with your mom real quick? So, as I was, pre as I was uh, uh, talking... Uh, you know, I, I envisioned your mother literally. You know, when we die, our eyes are opened. Right? That's what happens when you die. Save or unsaved, you open your eyes somewhere. Either up or down. But your mom opened her eyes, and she felt what life feels like. See, he is life. And, and, and I can envision her just falling flat in her face and praising his name. And God grabbing her and hugging her and saying, Welcome home. Amen. Thy good and faithful servant, for great is thine reward. And your mother sprinting around Jesus, praising his name. The thing that she couldn't do anymore in this life. And screaming. His glory, singing like never before. So I heard she liked to sing. Singing like never before. With angels in heaven. Praising God. And I hate to tell you, and I, and you, I know that you love your mom and she loves you, but she ain't thinking about you. <laughs> Hell, she is rejoicing in the glory of light, of life. You know what? And the Bible says that he is life. There is no death in him. I love the fact that when he called Lazarus, he called him by name. Lazarus, come forward. Because if he would have said, come forward, every tomb, every dead person in history would have came forward. Because he is life. Because he is what dwells in every person that calls upon his name as God, Lord, and Savior. Because in spite of what you might go in through right now, even though it could be passed beyond your ability, abilities and capabilities, He's waiting to deliver you. If you will only call upon His name. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your blessings. Thank You for Your Word. Thank you for the examples, Lord, that you put in your word for us. Lord, I know at times I've been uh, uh, guilty of this, Lord. We feel despaired, but we're never despaired. 
We are pressed beyond measure. And that could actually be taken place. Lord, I pray you that if anyone here today is going through that, Father, they call upon you, the one that can deliver them, the one that can truly deliver them. And Father, that uh, for us, Father, that are around, please, Lord, I beg you, allow us to be part of your comfort to that brother or sister. Father, your word tells us that by this shall all men know that ye are my disciple, if ye have love one toward another. Let us love the way you love us. Let us live the way that pleases you. Let our lives be a living sacrifice unto you. Father, if anyone here today does not know you, I pray you, Father, that today be the day they call upon your name. Father, I would simply challenge them to try you and guarantee them that they will never be the same. Let them call upon you, Father, in their own way. So long as they understand they're sinners, they need salvation. So long as they understand who Jesus is, the perfect Lamb of God that take away the, that take away the sin of the world. And that He's gone up to heaven and prepared a place for us. Father, for your saints, bless us, protect us always. In the precious name of Jesus, amen and amen. I would ask you, uh, um, please, excuse me, uh, pray for each other uh, without season. Pray for uh, uh, some plans that we got upcoming for this summer. Uh, I've been talking to Brother Frank uh, uh, about a, a little... Uh, Revival, if you want to call it, for teens. Uh, uh, because I'm going to be honest with you, we need it. God's people need to be reignited. Somehow, we've allowed ourselves to become dormant. We've allowed ourselves to become comfortable. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes when we become com too comfortable, God does something that shakes us up a little bit. Amen? Let's not wait for that to happen. Let's just get ignited out of love for him. Amen. I just, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, the older I get, I'm getting a little older, the less uh, uh, uncomfortable feelings I like. Right? So let's just serve God while things are good and not wait for the bad things. Amen. Amen. Uh, so part of that is this. And, and, and this is a challenge, family. Don't read the Bible alone. I don't mean by yourself. I mean, don't just read it. Study it. Don't just study it. Allow it to change you. And the way that happens is by obeying what it says. You see, I'll say it again, and this is going to become my newest thing, and this is my newest saying, is when the Bible is alive, when we grab it, we become alive you see it changes your mind listen have you ever heard of people that that, that, that read the scriptures to prove the scriptures to be false <coughs> and something happens to them it changes your thought process it changes your heart read the word of god daily listen we read garbage all the time amen we spend at least an hour on TV, amen? amen. And listen, I'm not condemning you for it. Be careful what you're watching. Because I'm going to tell you this much. What comes into this and this affects this. But give God at least the same amount of time. Pastor, I try to read for an hour and I fall asleep. That's called the flesh. That's fine. Wake up and continue to read. I'm going to tell you this much. My wife and I are going through the, through, through the Bible together. If you're married, start it. Pastor, I've read the Bible 117 times. Congratulations. Make it 118. Together. Together. Pastor, I'm not married. Congratulations. You have the freedom to serve God without, and I'm not trying to be funny. I, I love being married. But without interference. <laughs> I 
that's the, that's the truth about it. Paul the Apostle said that he'd rather everybody be like him, right? He meant being single and serving God. Because there's no responsibilities in regards to a family. The single guy, <laughs> the single person can get up and says, I'm going here to visit whomsoever to be a blessing unto them. And they can just get up and go. I can't do that. I got a wife and kids. My wife doesn't like it when I leave home. I'm trying to give her a break. <laughs> Listen, I'll be honest with you, family. I can be a handful. If you've known me long, I know it's hard to believe. I know. But I can be a handful. So when I, what are you looking at me that way, Courtney? <laughs> You're going to ask my wife and she's going to tell you that I'm not. Because she's a good woman. So you can see the people that are laughing the most are my own wife and kids. <laughs> but I got to tell you, read the Bible if you're married. Take this as a challenge. You're, you're not going to regret it. Read the Bible together. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about go through the Bible together. You know, grab one of those daily breads. It's got the, the how to read the Bible uh, in, through in one year and do it together. Takes, listen, it'll take you 15, maybe 20 minutes at night. Read it together. Let the last thing that courses through your brain in the day be the word of God. And pray together. And go to sleep. And wake up and repeat. Start the day with God. Go through the day with God. End the day with God. No better way to live. Jenny. That's something wrong with me. <laughs> oh, um, what is it called? Let me just turn this off. Before I start saying stuff that I, you know. <laughs>